This is Jack Jackson with Part 5B of our six series of lectures on continuous distributions. This is our second one on normal distributions. Now we're going to learn how to do some computations. In particular, we're going to learn some shortcuts that are built into TI-84 and similar calculators. I think you're going to really enjoy uh, these shortcuts as we get to learn how to use them. Um, first of all, in the old days, before we had computers and calculators, Mathematicians use numerical calculus techniques to very painstakingly go through and compute probabilities for standard normal and other probability distributions. It took, this took a lot of time doing by hand calculations. Very painstaking process. And they recorded these in tables. And then people used those tables then to help them compute probabilities. And they did that because. Um, well, they didn't have calculators and things like we have now. And you will usually find some version of a table that's in the back of a statistics books, some, usually in the back cover or an appendix, sometimes in the front of the book. And you'll see all kinds of different tables for standard normal distributions. You'll see some that are give left tail like this, shaded area. In other words, you look up the, uh, you give it the Z value, the C value, rather, and that's this is the C value right here, and it will compute this area here. Or it will maybe it'll be a right tailed instead. You give it a C value and it will compute the area to the right. Sometimes these will go all the way uh, for a range of values here, both positive and negative, and sometimes they'll only do just positive or just negative because that will uh, you can take advantage of what you know about the symmetry of the curve and the fact that you get an area is a half from negative infinity up to the mean or from the mean up to infinity. You also see done as an interval uh, usually starting at zero so this might be uh, positive values for for C and you can see a table like this. Sometimes you'll even see one for a two-tailed where we have a certain area that's split evenly among the two tails and so we'll have a C and then we're looking at the probability that X is greater than C or less than C less than minus C at the same time. So you'll see all these different kinds of uh, tables and maybe others as well depending on which textbook you pick up or or which resource. And basically the way they'll do on these tables is you look up uh, an X value usually like the um, ones you typically see in a textbook like maybe you're looking at one like this one here. Uh, maybe on the left you'll see uh, the first digit decimal and then a uh, one decimal place and then across the top you'll see point zero and then a second decimal place you'll find where those rows and columns meet so if you want to look up the probability uh, say if it's this kind of table from zero up to 1.23 you'd find 1.2 in the left 0 0.03 in the column across the top find where those column and rows meet and that'll give you the probability and then you looked up backwards for that find the probability you're looking for in the middle of the table and then work backwards to find the values um, the X's that will give you that so you read those tables both directions now now although we typically have these tables in most statistics books they're usually only accurate to four decimal places and uh, it's even worse than that because the inputs usually are only accurate to three significant digits, two decimal places, and the outputs are usually only good to four decimal places. And what happens if you want to find something that's in between some values in the tables? And this actually happens a lot. And if you're doing that, then you have to round off or interpolate somehow, estimate. And furthermore, if you're using these things in further computations, we run into problems. So when all these problems come up, uh, it's very typical that your final answer uh, even though you have a four decimal place table, it's usually only accurate to about two decimal places. In fact, there's one textbook that we used recently that just really drove me crazy because they insisted on using a table to do the homework problems. In fact, they went out of their way in designing the homework problems to make it, it was actually harder to make the problems where they would work right with the table because they would work these with the table, get an answer, and then insist that you put down an answer to four decimal places when actually when you did it to the table uh, using the table only uh, two digits are accurate 
And that was okay, except that the real problem was when you did it on a calculator and got an answer that was accurate to four decimal places, it counted the correct answer wrong um, and the incorrect answer correct, uh, which was very frustrating for me. So I hope that I've uh, eliminated all those problems in the homework online. But what are we going to do? We're going to use a TI-84 similar calculator to, to do all these computations. So today, let's think about it. If you're going to do this computations or anything, you're probably going to have to have a calculator anyway. And how likely is it you're going to be carrying around your statistics book? Well, I know you love it so much, you, maybe you'll carry it around with you all the time. But, uh, you know, oh, come on, most of you guys are going to sell the book after you get out of class. So, but you might hang on to your TI-84. It would be a good idea. And so you can actually get much more accurate answers much more easily, and it's much more likely that you'll have this technology with you than any kind of table. And even if you did have the table, you're probably going to need a calculator to work with it anyway. So we will assume that all computations will be done on a TI-84 or similar calculator. There are commands in Excel and statistical packages like Minitab and SPSS and so forth that will calculate these things as well. So let's see if we can use what we've already known about uh, computing probabilities. Uh, when we know the normal PDF, when we know a PDF in general, how can we find probabilities from a continuous PDF? Okay, so we're looking at a standard normal. First of all, what's the probability that x is less than zero? Actually, that one you don't need any calculator at all. You should have that probability memorized. What is it? Yeah, it's just 0.5, right? You know from the symmetry and the properties we studied uh, in the previous video that the probability that x is less than zero on a standard normal is a half. Or in general, the probability that x is less than the mean is one half because the mean is also the median and the mode for that matter. So you can figure out these other three probabilities here. So press pause and come back in a few minutes if you've got anywhere with that. Well, one of the things that you may want to remember is that you may want to remember what the formula is. So then you have to memorize this relatively complicated formula here and plug in the values. The first number here in the parentheses is the mean, mu. So that goes right here and place this Greek letter mu in the um, formula. And where the sigma is here in the bottom of this fraction and the bottom of the fraction that's in the exponent, that's the second number here. So be sure you can put that in, y1, in your, in your calculator, and then go from there. See if that helps a little bit. Do that and finish this. Well, let's look at an example here. <clears throat> so we take this formula here. If we plug in mu is 0, this just becomes x squared for the numerator. And we plug in sigma is 1, the denominator here just becomes 2, and the sigma basically disappears there. So our formula is 1 divided by square root of 2 pi times e to the power negative 1 times x squared over 2, close parentheses around the exponent. So we put our PDF in y1. We're going to set our window to get a good drawing of this. And I, for the moment, I have it going from negative 7 to 7 on the x's and from negative 0.1 to 0.41. And there's the graph. And that's a decent looking graph, so we'll stay with that. And we want to calculate an area. We use the area calculator here, number 7, this numerical integral. This is an area calculator. It asks us for a lower limit, and we put in negative 1, and our upper limit is 2.5. Hit Enter, and it will shade and compute the area. So that will give us the shading of it. Or we can actually just uh, do it from the home screen, do Math 9, which gives us this FNINT, which is our area calculator. Since we already have the formula in Y1, I could just get Y1 by pressing variables, V-A-R-S, right arrow to Y variables, enter a few times until we get Y1 to come up here. Comma, it's always X here, comma, and these are our A and our B that we're going between, negative 1 and 2.5, and then hit close parentheses, enter. And we get our value of our probability, it's about 83.5%. This basic technique works for any continuous function, as long as you know what the probability density function is, the PDF, you put that in Y1, and this basic technique works for any such PDF. You just have to know what the formula is. 
Okay, so for the next one, we want to go a normal 3, 2. Now, the formula gets a little bit more complicated with the 3 and the 2 in it. Not too much, though. We replace the mu by 3, so this is x minus 3 right here. The sigma is 2 here and here, 2 uh, here, and then 2 squared there. And so now there's the PDF. Uh, this particular one, we want a little bit of different window. Uh, the mean is 3, and the standard deviation is 2. So we want to go a little bit either side of 3. Uh, what did I do? It looks like I went about 3 standard deviations each side. 3 times 2 is 6, so we want to add and subtract 6 from this. 3 minus 6 is negative 3. 3 plus 6 is 9. So that's going to give us 3 standard deviations here. And still, this is uh, pretty good for the size of the window. It's going to be okay for the Ys. So work that out, and there we get a graph. Looks pretty good. So now we can calculate and shade the area by going to calculate, which is second trace, second calc, and then that will give us, then we choose number 7, you can just type number, press 7 right there. It'll ask you for the lower limit, put in 2, then enter, upper limit, 5, enter, and it will shade and tell you the value. We can also do it directly from the home screen without doing all the graphing. Just type in function integrate. If we've already got it in as y1, put y1 there, comma x, comma 2, comma 5. If we don't have it in y1 already, instead of typing y1, type all the stuff that we typed up here. Uh, the little, little square is actually a 1 underneath that. little black rectangle is covering up our 1. Okay, what do we do about one that, that's got a tail there? So we want to go from x is less than 7. That's from negative infinity up to 7. Well, what we've already seen about these um, normal distributions is that a um, that if the um, there's very little beyond 10 stand, standard deviations above and below the mean. So we can use the me, mean minus 10 times the standard deviation to be a pretty good approximation for uh, negative infinity and the mean plus 10 times the standard deviation to be a good def good approximation of infinity. So this is M, I should say mu, minus 10 sigma. Okay, so that's going to be 3 minus 10 times 2. Uh, that's negative 17. So we'll use negative 17 as our approximation of negative infinity. And to get it on the graphing window, I'm going to start that as my, my, my x. So there's very little going to be off the screen to the left. And let's see, what would, what would positive infinity, you know, be a good estimate of positive infinity? Well, we're going to, again, we can use mu plus 10 sigma. So uh, 3 plus 10 times 2 is 23. So I, I went from negative 17 to positive 23 on my x's. And again, the y's of negative 0.1 to 0.41 actually worked okay on this one. So um, now we want to com compute that by a lower limit of negative 17 and positive upper limit of 17 and we get this shaded. Now by the way there's something I did first. Notice I went to draw which is uh, second program I think um, and um, draw and then do number one which is clear drawing and hit enter and that will erase the shading. Otherwise what's going to happen is any shading that you had on there from the previous problem is going to show up again that may mess up the picture a little bit. So be sure you clear your drawing after every time. So draw, clear draw, enter. And we have that there. Again, we could do this directly at the home screen as well. So here we have it at the home screen. Um, we, again, we used uh, from negative 17 to 7 and did that. We can also avoid trying to approximate infinity if we use our um, knowledge about the symmetry, the symmetry of the curve. We know that the area less than the mean is a half. So the 0.5 right here on this last screen down here on the right, that will get us the area up to the mean of 3 and then we can just go from 3 to 7 for the rest. So we can do this function integrate or area calculator um, x is going from 3 to 7, and then add on the half, which is the ones that are less than 3. Um, you get the same answer either way, so either way is fine. 
But it's techniques like that last one that you sometimes have to use if you're just going to use a table. Now, there's some further shortcuts that are built in a TI-84. Now, so far, we haven't used anything on this that we couldn't do with any continuous distribution. Everything we here could be done with any continuous distribution. But the normal is special. It's so used so often that we have even better shortcuts built in. So the first thing we're going to do is graph the normal PDF. So um, here I already have in Y1 a normal PDF with mean 3 and standard deviation 2. That's by actually typing the formula in. But look what I can do here. I can put, I'm going to use Y3, normal PDF of X with a mean of 3 and a standard deviation of 2. The, the, the syntax is normal PDF of, it, then X is your variable, and then you give it the mean and the standard deviation. If you just give it the X and no mean and standard deviation, it assumes the mean is 0 and the standard deviation is 1. In other words, it assumes that it is a normal uh, PDF that's from a standard normal. Now, the way you get normal PDF is you go to distributions, which is second, and then the VARS button, second variables, will give you distribution. It's written above that in blue on a TI-84. And that will give you, then you, you select the very first one, number one. And when I did that, that gave me the normal PDF of, and then I typed in the x, comma, the 3, comma, 2. And what I want you to do is look at the table here. When I did a table, notice the table's identical, and when I graph, the two graphs went right on top of each other. And so this is a shortcut, and notice with this, you don't really even have to know the formula for the PDF. It automatically does it for you. That's kind of a complicated formula, so that's a big help for us. We don't have to type in, we don't have to memorize that formula. We can just use the normal PDF. That's pretty cool. So use this to graph um, the, sh the bell-shaped curve, and then we can maybe use it to compute some probabilities. Well, we use the normal PDF to graph the curve like we just did. If we want to find probabilities, we don't use that. What we use is the normal CDF. So CDF for probabilities, PDF to graph the bell curve. And here's your syntax. So this one's not really a CDF. A CDF normally uh, is a probability from minus infinity up to the input. This one's really a probability between two things. So it's an interval calculate. You give it an interval and it finds the probability on that interval. So in other words, you give it a lower and upper bound. So it's, the syntax is normal CDF of a, B, A, comma, B, then comma, the mean, comma, the standard deviation, and this will give you the probability that A is less than X, which is less than B. In other words, the probability that A is between those values of A and B that you type in. Again, if you leave off the mean and standard deviation and just put normal CDF A, B, then it's going to assume that that's a mean of 0 and standard deviation of 1. Again, it assumes the standard normal. So if we want to compute the probability that x is between 3 and 9 for a normal 4, 2, um, that, by that way we mean that x is distributed normally with a mean of 4 and a standard deviation of 2, then it's pretty simple. It's normal CDF of 3, 9, 4, 2, close parentheses, enter. Boom, it's very easy. That is, now that is sweet there. That is so cool how you can do that, and it is very, very easy. It's much easier than using tables. It's much easier than than doing the other, even the, the much even easier than using the the FNINT thing on the calculator. It's doing exactly the same thing as the FNINT thing. It's just built in for a normal. So again, you get both of these things uh, by doing second variables, and that will give you this distribution. And number one is the PDF, and number two is the CDF for the normal. And by the way, this is where we found some discrete information, too, by arrowing down. This, if you remember, this is where we found the, the PDF and CDF for a, for a uh, binomial distribution, geometric distribution, for, for example. But normal is right there at the top because it's used so much. All right, what if we want to see the picture, though? That last 
thing from the home screen gave us a nice number, but it didn't draw these nice little pictures. What if we want to see those? Well, we're going to be able to do this as well. We're going to look at some examples here, and uh, we're, going to, we're going to get some shading as well. So, for example, if we want to find between 8 and 11. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is clear my drawing, and I want to choose Shade Normal 8, 11, 10, and 3. Now, the way to get that, let's see, did we skip over something? Yes, we skipped over one here. Okay, here we go. We want to compute and shade the area from 2 to 5. Let's do this one first. So the syntax is shade normal, shade norm, A, B, 2, 5 in this case, comma, mean, comma, standard deviation. And once again, if you leave off the mean and standard deviation, it assumes standard normal. Assumes 0 and 1. So notice here, I don't even have anything in my graphing menu. I don't have a PDF. I don't have a formula. I don't have anything. It's completely empty. It could have something there or not, but I'm, it doesn't require to have anything in the y equals screen. All I need to do is go to shade norm, and the way you get that is second variables, which is distribution, right arrow to go over to draw, and it's the first one, number one. And that gives you on the screen shade norm of, and then you enter in the two, five, four, and two. The first two is the, the lower bound two, the five is the upper bound five uh, there, the four is the mean, and this too comes from the standard deviation up here is two. Close parentheses, hit enter. At this point, this screen will actually disappear. When you come back to it, it'll say done. But it will disappear and give you this last screen, which shades it out and it draws the normal notice it draws a normal distribution. It figures out a window all by itself. So it'll figure out an appropriate window, draw it, shade the appropriate part, and tell you that, and it also even tells you what the lower and upper are. So it tells you that it's shading between 2 and 5 for the x's and that the area shaded is 0.532807 to and that's the probability uh, that x is between 2 and 5 from this particular distribution. Isn't that cool? So let's you try this. You try it with some of these examples here. Okay, there's five, four examples here. Uh, they're all from a normal distribution with mean 10 and standard deviation 3. And go ahead and see if you can get these worked out. In a couple of these cases, you may have to approximate infinity. Remember, we can use um, x, uh, we can use mu plus or minus uh, 10 times the standard deviation to approximate positive or negative infinity. Uh, press pause now and then come back when you're done. All right, well, here's the first one. That's probably the easiest one. And again, we're going to clear the drawing first. Okay. And then we're going to do shade normal, which is uh, uh, second uh, variables, which gets you distribution, right arrow to shade, or and then um, to draw or shade there, and you can shade in. That's the first one there. Again, we give it 8, 11, then the mean of 10, and the standard deviation of 3. Close parentheses, hit enter, and boom, there it is right there. We could also compute it without shading it by doing normal CDF. Again, math, uh, or second, uh, VARS to get you distribution, and it'll be the second one. Okay, And then just type in the rest of those numbers the same as you did on the shade normal. And again, we get the same output. This one gave us about a few more digits, about four more digits than the one on the graphing screen did. So if you need the more digits, you may need to go to the home screen and do it. Uh, but but uh, most cases, you know, six digits, that's going to be, be plenty. Uh, but if you need the extra digits, you can do it from there. And the one in the middle, of course, gives you a nice little picture to go with it. Very cool. All right, what if we want a left tail? Well, probably the best way to do this is just to put in some number that we can substitute in for infinity. So we're going to use uh, the mean, which was uh, 10, minus 10 times the standard deviation of 3. And I just left it in there. I didn't bother to figure out what it is. That's for negative infinity. And then we want to go up to 4, and the mean is 10, and the standard deviation is 3. And then this computes the probability. If we want to shade it, we want to first clear our drawing. 
then do shade norm and the inputs exactly the same as the one over here and there it does it and shades it now unfortunately it's hard to see much of the shading it's right here is four I don't know if you can see my little um, cursor moving around there but it's right at four there and just to the left you can barely see any of it shaded because it's a pretty small area it's only um, just a little over two percent similarly we can use the right tail by starting at 19 and going to positive infinity well again we can't really put in positive infinity but we can put in something that's big enough that we'll get accuracy as far as our calculator is going to go and that is we use uh, the mean plus 10 times the standard deviation there for the for uh, our replace positive infinity there with that as an approximation and uh, again mean and standard deviation there's it there it is again clear my drawing first and then do shade normal the same inputs and we get that this one's even smaller 0 0.00135 there's a little tail shaded here at the end on the right but on this scale I can't even see it perhaps if I zoomed in there I could see a little bit of it shaded in um, but um, not really there now this one it's actually easier to shade what's not there and that's going to be how, the way we're going to figure it out so this one's a two-tailed situation where we have a tail to the left of two and also a tail to the right of seven and we want to so one thing we could do is figure those two individually shade them and actually if you don't clear your drawing you'll actually get them both shaded but this area number that comes up here will be only for the whichever one you did last what I decided to do here was do the exact opposite, to shade what's not there. So what I did is I, I did, uh, on the shade normal, I did from 2 to 7 and found out the shaded area was right here. And there's, a, there's an unshaded tail, it's hard to see it, to the left, and a big unshaded tail to the right. And, of course, the area here, this is the complementary area, so you want to do 1 minus that. In fact, that's how I did it on, on the screen here at the home screen. I just did 1 minus normal CDF of 2, 7, uh, from 2 to 7, mean of 10, standard deviation of 3, and that gives us uh, what's unshaded in this picture down on the right is uh, about 85%. So a lot of times it's easier to figure the complement, and of course then you can just subtract from 1. Now what if we want to graph the CDF? Now let's remember, in general, we can put the PDF in one, and here I've used the, the calculator shortcut for the normal PDF, but if I had any formula, I could write the PDF in there. And then for Y2, you can do the area calculator, function integrate, F-N-I-N-T, and then put of Y1, X, and then from 0 to X, if this last part is the probability that... Uh, of x being less than or equal to zero, which I've picked one with the mean is zero, okay, and so the probability to the left of zero is 0 0.5, so that's why it's 0.5 there. So this is sort of the more general way of doing it, and this thing is going to graph really slow because it's going through lots of approximation uh, routines to get this, but this thicker one here is the normal uh, CDF, or at least a very good approximation of it, and Notice that it starts at zero, actually an asymptote of zero, comes up, actually hits, in this case it hits a half right above the mean, okay, and then because the mean's also the median, and then it comes there up and levels off at one. So it always goes from zero to one. So that's why our window should be set essentially from zero to one. Uh, I went a little bit below because I want some room for when it does calculations to come in down there. So this is sort of the general method of doing it. But there's another shortcut. We can graph the CDF by doing normal CDF. Instead of doing the function integrate stuff, we can use normal CDF. And we want to use minus infinity up to x. So again, I used, um, the, here's one. Um, uh, I'm graphing the, the normal PDF has a mean of 8 and standard deviation of 2. So for minus infinity, I use mean minus 10 times the standard deviation. So it's 8 minus 10 times 2 with respect to x. And then it's going to go from 8 to 2. 8 and 2 are the, I mean, 8 and 2 are a mean and a standard deviation there at the end. 
and close parentheses. So this is a, using the built-in normal CDF to help us graph this. And, of course, we need to set some sort of window that works for this. Um, let's see, 8 minus 10 times 2, that's 8 minus 20, uh, that's... Uh, Actually, I don't need to go that far back. What did I go? I went to negative 2, so I went down, what, like, something like 4 or 5 standard, 5 standard deviations. Uh, 5 times 2 is 10, 8 minus 10 is negative 2, so I went 5 down, and 5 up would be uh, 18. So what I did is I went 5 standard deviations above and below the mean. So that puts the mean right here in the middle of the screen, horizontally, and uh, we've gone 5 standard deviations either side. That's going to be plenty, because... There's very little area past that anyway. And to be sure I get the CDF, I need to go from 0 to 1, basically. And I went a little bit below 1. I use Below 0, I usually use negative 0.1 to give me some screen down here at the bottom for when it does some calculations later on if I want to use this uh, for, to uh, keep going. And so, there we go. Nice little, uh, so the bell-shaped curve is the PDF. And then the d uh, darker curve, kind of like a kind of like an S, that's the, uh, the CDF. And the CDF curve on a continuous distribution, almost all of them are going to look very similar. They're going to start out either horizontal or close to horizontal at zero. They're going to come up, somehow increase up, and then level off or either hit or level off at one and stay there across. Once we have the, the, the uh, CDF, however we get it, we can find an inverse probability. And again, this is for any kind of continuous distribution. If we have the inverse probability, one way we can find, if we have the, the CDF, we can do an inverse probability. And that is, when I mean inverse probability, I, I mean instead of having the x value and figuring the probability, this goes the other way around. We know the probability and we want to find the x. In other words, we want to find the, we, so here's an example. If we have the probability that x is less than p is equal to 0.75, find the value of p. So we already know the probability is 0.75, the cumulative probability. We want to find the x value there that goes with it. Well, in general, when you have a formula, uh, a function, and you know a y value and you want to find an x, the way you do it on the calculator is you graph a horizontal line at the y value. So you let y3 be the y value we have. In this case, it's a probability, a cumulative probability of 0.75. That graphs this horizontal line, and then we just do a calculate intersection. And you see that it turns out that it's about 9.35. Another name for that, of course, is the 75th percentile. So that's the x value for which 75% of the um, data is below it. Or in other words, the probability that if you randomly select a piece of data from this distribution, that probability that it's below this value is 75%. So if we did went back to the CDF, uh, the PDF, excuse me, and shaded the graph up to uh, this p-value, we would find that that area would be 75%, 0.75 would be that area, that would be a left-tailed area. Well, guess what? We've got an even better shortcut for that on the on the TI-84. We're all the time wanting to do this inverse probability, so guess what? For, for the normal, at least, it's built in. And we go to, um, same way we got the normal PDF and CDF, it was distribution, which was second uh, VARS, second VARS, and uh, that gives you the distribution, and it's number three this time, inverse norm. So the syntax is you give it the p-value, the probability value, and then the mean and the standard deviation. And once more, if you don't give it the mean and standard deviation, it assumes it's a um, standard normal. So the inverse norm of 0.75, comma, 8, comma, 2 is 9.35 roughly. And again, that's the same value we got before. But look how easy that is. You just uh, just go straight there and boom, you can get it to work out really quickly.
So this gives you an idea about the uh, shortcuts that you have on the TI-84. And um, I think you can find that they are very, very useful. So most of them are found right here under distribution. The normal PDF, that's for graphing the bell-shaped curve. Normal CDF, that's for computing probabilities. Inverse normal is when you have the probabilities and you want to work backwards and find the x's that, that give you those cumulative probabilities. And then there's one more as we went over to draw, and that one is would shade the, the uh, probabilities. It basically does the same thing as number. It's kind of a combination of number one and two because it draws the normal PDF, but then it computes the probability like the normal CDF and gives you a drawing. So those are the four basic things that we have on the TI-84 very very nice little shortcuts for us so you want to get very good at using these particular uh, shortcuts